treatment of the, of the human species. It, it, it's just beyond, beyond parallel. It's been progressive, uh, it building on, standing on the shoulders of giants. In my own field of biology, uh, since Darwin, uh, we now understand why we're here, we understand what life is all about, we understand what it's for, uh, we don't understand in every detail how it works, but we know what it's here for. And post-Darwin, uh, we, we no longer have to resort to superstition, when faced with the complexity of life, the elegance of life, the, the strong illusion of design of life, which after all is a hugely persuasive delusion, then after Darwin, in, in, staying within biology, molecular genetics, the achievement from 1953 onwards, mm. has been a quite astounding achievement. The, 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 the reduction of genetics to a branch of information technology. It's become a branch of computer science. Um, the idea that every living creature carries within it a digital archive, a database of the way its ancestors lived. I mean, Darwin would have killed for such information. It would have been absolutely amazing to Darwin. What a tragedy that he's not here to, to share in it. I, I think that it is uh, something we should be enormously proud of as a species. But I agree with Brian that it's also an enormous challenge for the future as well. Yeah, Steve? And of course, of course the, the uh, culminating step in this progression is that we're turning the tools of science upon ourselves, understanding uh, how the human brain works, how human societies and culture emerge from interactions among uh, in, the intelligent organisms such as us. And I, I like to think that it's that final step of <laughs> turning the microscope around and looking at us as humans that explains what's so special about science and why it's such a fragile, vulnerable enterprise. Namely, that there's much in the operation of the human brain that runs counter to the ideals of science and enlightenment more generally. Some of them are our cognitive limitations that, that uh, Brian alluded to. It's very hard to wrap your mind around a, a black hole or relativity or some of the findings from uh, quantum physics. Some of them are because there are attitudes of mind that are uh, hard to, to uh, shake ourselves out of when it comes to familiar phenomena. It's hard to look at other people and not imagine that they're animated by a, a soul. Mm -hmm. It's hard to look at uh, complex life and imagine that it could have arisen without a designer. But I think some of the impediments come more from our social emotions than our cognitive limitations. Namely, the idea that you should believe in something because it's true does not come naturally to people. Uh, in, in most times and places, the assertion of beliefs has been a sign of uh, solidarity with one's culture. You say you believe things to show that you're a, a loyal member of a coalition. Mm. It's a matter of exerting uh, authority. It's a matter of uh, politeness and convention. And the kind of social norms that function within science, within democracies, within well-run intellectual forums like, uh, like universities that say, you, sh you must have a reason for your beliefs. You may be called upon to uh, provide them. You may legitimately be challenged without it being a form of disloyalty or insult. That a, uh, a graduate student can challenge a Nobel Prize winner if she sees a flaw in his argument and it's not a sign of disrespect to him as a person or to the community. That the all uh, discourse and all belief are subordinated to what's true is a very unnatural uh, social norm. And that, I think, is what science, but more generally, I think of as enlightenment, uh, secular humanism, well-functioning democracy. Those are the values that animate all of those enterprises of which science is a particularly successful part. Now, uh, but yeah, but you know, I'm not sure that, that that's true, but except I think for the public, what, how we know it's true or not is a, very, is a very different thing. Whether their willingness to accept that science can distinguish, certainly or at least what's false, which is more important, uh, it, I, I think that's just not generally accepted. I, I obviously I agree with, with Brian and Richard that the, the, the last 350 years have been remarkable. But at the same time, if you, if you look at, at people on the street, if you ask people why a book will fall faster than a piece of paper, most people will say the book is heavier, in spite of the fact that we've known for, for hundreds of years that that's not the case. If you ask most Americans, at least, whether they quote unquote believe in evolution, most of them will say they haven't. So there, there is this disconnect between this remarkable, remarkable enterprise that has literally changed the world and people's perceptions of it. 
So I think the biggest challenge for us is not just to convince them of the, of the remarkable developments. I mean, for most people, I think for, when they think of science, they think of technology, that science has produced better things that make their lives better. But the ideas and process is something we've done a very poor job, I think, of explaining to people about. And I think until, I think that's the big disconnect, that people need to understand how we make progress in science. And, and, and that's a real challenge. Well, one thing that comes immediately out of what you've just been saying is that science education, especially for the young, the grade school level, has got to be thought about really carefully because uh, it's a very familiar thing that a lot of kids get put off science, find it too difficult, they find the math too difficult. There have got to be ways of, of presenting this material to, to people that really attract them and bring them in and get more people involved. It's not just a matter of producing more scientists. It's a matter of producing greater scientific literacy. Because the crucial thing at the moment is, you say uh, that people are aware of the fact that uh, technology brings benefits. It also brings serious disbenefits in the form of weapons and you know, accidents that might happen and so on. And that makes people nervous. That's one of the reasons why some people can be hostile to science too. And hostility is always a function of ignorance, largely. I mean, well-informed hostility is something to worry about, but generally speaking, it's, it's ignorance. And so this business about uh, improving scientific literacy in the community is absolutely key. And we know this. There are a heck of a lot of people out there who don't know anything about science. And we've got two problems. One is the people who don't know that they don't know anything and, and who need to be educated. And worse still, the people who don't know anything, they know they don't know anything and they don't care. And so that's, that's another problem too. One, in one or another way, and there are lots of enterprises now. You know, Richard has been uh, a professor of public understanding of science. Brian runs this brilliant thing in New York every summer which educates people, finds ways of getting the message across there uh, in unconventional, exciting, entertaining sort of ways. That is where the focus has to be now. It's absolutely crucial to our time with this increasingly rapid explosion of, of insight, of, of mastery of aspects of nature, that more and more people should be good participants in the conversation about what science is, what it's for, what effects it can have on us. And, and that comes down to this project of uh, you know, a lifelong process of educating people to be more literate and to understand something of what's going on. Yeah, I have to say, I can't, I can't say I agree with you. I mean. I agree with absolutely everything you say there because um, I've encountered so many kids who when I begin to tell them some of the interesting things or the things that I think are interesting about science, things about cosmology or astrophysics or, or particle theory, to see their eyes widen and have them say, that's science? Because that's not what they've experienced mm -hmm. science to be because so often in the classroom we quickly focus in on the details trying to get kids to solve equations and balance reactions and so forth. And the reason for that is clear. The details are important. They're also very easy to examine, right? So you can have tests that are really based on the details, getting the right answer. And if we don't have a commensurate focus on the big, wonderful ideas of science that get kids excited about it, they just don't care enough about the details to really want to engage with them. Yeah, there's, there's a, the, you all know Natalie Angier's wonderful book, The Canon, in yes, which she yes. has an interview with Peter Gallison, the historian of science at Harvard. And, and, and Peter says there's this incredibly difficult task. You take these bright, energetic, energy, uh, you know, information-sucking objects. And beat science out of them or something, right. And <laughs> you, you, you manage to push this rock to the hill, top of the hill there of, of making them completely disinterested. Right. Uh, actually, and, like and, and Natalie says that she, uh, then what happens is that about the age of 12, people can go and buy their kids uh, a membership card to the Museum of Contemporary Art and they leave the science behind, which is why the World Science Festival and all the things that you guys are involved in is sound like it's... But it's not just the kids, is it? There has yeah. to be this entire spectrum yeah. being... And I'm going to throw in a... One of the reasons... Uh, I'm going to throw in a plug for while we're here. One of the reasons we, we, we've picked Origins to focus on <laughs> is specifically because we found that, that Origins is, is an area where, which ex both ex excites interest and controversy. And, and gets motiv you want to motivate people to get over the threshold to at least listen. And, yeah. and you want to bring together enough people that get people excited. And I have to say that one of the most exciting events that's happened in this meeting was when we, ha we were in an inner city school in, in, in Phoenix. We had a thousand high school kids for two hours and it was like a basketball event with three of the Nobel laureates here. And the kids, I, I just, I wouldn't have believed it. They didn't have to be 